time have more deals. My goal is like to make me a part of it. Make me feel comfortable. It was a little rocky, but I'm in August and September I'm in my best month. And now I should have one for October. I mean, and we know in the Midwest, like this is going to be a slower time to be generally in the winter. I don't know. <laughs> I I told people I told people other people have their finances, but when it comes to our own, they're not going to do that. Good morning, everyone. People are still filtering in. Filter. Filter. Let me get Bob to quit talking back here. I'm listening. He's listening. He's being a good listener. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all in the house of the Lord today. Um, as uh, we, this is going to sound weird, okay? As we culminate Missions Month, uh, we have a special speaker. And the reason I say it's weird is because really, all year, is Missions Year, right? I mean, it's, we, we should be focusing our attention on those who do not yet know, you know, and those who are in need, and those, you know, re Read James 1.27, and that'll, that'll tell you what you need to know about caring for the orphans and widows and all of that. But there are people all over the world who do not know Jesus. And as Christ followers, we are a part of the mobilized force to help them hear about Jesus. So I have a few announcements for you today, and it's great to be back, by the way. I got to, today's our Faith Promise Sunday where we're going to be talking about missions and we're going to be giving a special offering for our World Evangelism Fund. Uh, last week, I was at, as, as Pastor Jess told you last week, I was at uh, the Indianapolis Southside Church of the Nazarene preaching at their faith promise. And they wanted someone who has planted a church before to come and, and preach. And uh, it was just a wonderful service. Thank you so much for... Um, you know, for being here and uh, praying for me as I was preaching them. A few announcements for us. First, Next Point Ministries game day is today after the service. So if you are 40 and under, uh, or the Trozens, uh, please, please, because they need it. There's leaders of it. I'm not trying to say anything. I'm not, you didn't. <laughs> 40 and under, this is, this is our young adult group, and uh, we're going to have a great time there at the Trozen's house uh, playing some games. Also, I mean, I'm not going to have a fun time now because... <laughs> anyway. Also, midweek Bible study is at uh, 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 28th. Everyone is welcome. And uh, Margie wanted me to tell everyone that it's not just for ladies, because that's the only constituency that we've had so far in that particular Bible study, but it's for anybody. And it's a, it's a mid, midday Bible study or, or morning Bible study. So if you're able to make it, uh, come on over, and uh, they'd love to have you. Iron Strikes Men's Ministry is Saturday, October 1st, 8.30 at Perkins. That's this Saturday. It's this coming Saturday. Um, we always have a great time and, and a great group of guys there. Uh, next Sunday, October 2nd, following the morning service, pack your lunch and come support our kids who are riding a mile for, uh, for our wheels for mission at, uh, missions at Holland Park. Our kids might be asking for sponsors. Um, we've already started to see that, some, some 
asks uh, for giving for that. Uh, our, our particular meal, Meals for Missions, we're talking about Dan Duke, who's in Cameroon. He's, he's ministering there, and he's a Bible translator. Um, and uh, he is, he is uh, very limited on, on transportation, let's say. And so we're trying to help him out through that gift. Um, also, the prayer vigil is 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on the 8th of October. So please sign up in the foyer and or write down your uh, prayer requests and give it to a pastor. Prayer requests may also be emailed or texted to Pastor Margie. We desire that all spaces be filled with someone praying in person in, at the church building. So I want to make sure to emphasize that what we're trying to go for are people coming to the building and making an effort to come here. And of course, the same God who, who um, hears you at your home or here is the same God. But we're trying to get, there's a special thing we're trying to do here, trying to get people here in the building praying from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So that doesn't mean you have to be here the entire time. Just sign up for an hour slot. So we're just so thankful in advance what God is going to do through that ministry. We have special guests, and I'll have to, oh, oh I'm sorry, uh, communication cards. If you look around you, you'll see uh, a card, and we have special questions on the back or on the, in, on the front. If you want us to know about a particular prayer request that you have or a praise that you have, we would love to hear about that. Um, he, he's looking at me. Um, so we'd love to hear more about what, what you'd like us to know about. And we are very excited to be able to reach out to you accordingly. As we continue in service today, would you please stand? And we are very, very... What did you say? Oh, he's already he's ready to sing, yeah. He's a rose, so he already is a good singer. So, so we, we are very thankful to have Lyndall and Kay Browning with us today. Um, they... Well, they'll, I'll let, you, let them tell you more about themselves, but you've heard them before, perhaps, if you've been here with, for a long time. Um, they are missionaries that, they're retired missionaries that were in the Middle East, and uh, we're just so excited to, to have you today. As we get started today, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that goes before us that pulls our hearts and guides us in ways that we cannot do ourselves. We ask that you bless this time together. Pour your Holy Spirit over this, this congregation today. Help us to hear your voice and to feel your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
in this family as they go through this turmoil. And I know that Jesus and the Lord God is more mighty than this demon of darkness. And I pray that you will pray with me for this boy and for the rejection and rebuking of the evil one from his life. Yes. And I'm going to pray to him right now. What's his first name, Lenny? Alex. Alex. The father is Jeremy. Okay. Father God. Thank you, Lord. I pray to you right now. And I know, God, that you are more powerful than anyone in the darkness and led by the darkness and the darkness. God, I pray to bring your light upon the life of Alex. Help this family through this time of concern and worry and, and doubt of uh, the issues that are before them. It's like I do not understand what is going on in this young boy's life. And I don't understand why the power of darkness selected this young boy to, uh, to mess with his mind, to uh, direct him, lead him in the wrong directions, and, and uh, to just mess up with this young boy, a young boy. Uh, God, I pray that you will send the Holy Spirit in its mightiness, his mightiness, your mightiness. I pray that you will come upon this family, this father, this young boy, and touch that demon and rebuke him forever and ever and send him into the pit of hell. In Jesus' name, who is almighty, all powerful. Amen. Amen. I want to share a video with you this morning of uh, some missionaries from France, and then our speaker will come and share with us. Hi, we're the Gretchens. You're missionaries in France for the last 12 years, and we wanted to send you a little video about something that's uh, really important to us and to you guys as the Church of Nazarene. We participate in what's called the Alabaster Offering. And today our kids are actually going to produce the video and share a little bit more about what Alabaster is all about.
The same happened last year for the church in Tulsi. Alabaster runs from the Bible building, and now they're looking for that new building inside the transform an office building into the Tulsi church in the Even the first church that was ever bought in France, the church of that city, that's what I would call it. So it was bought into the building that Alabaster offered. They are. They have. Been, Alabaster bought that. They decided that they needed to move closer to some of the work that's in CM work. So they said they found a place near Fontainebleau, and they purchased a standalone house that is a huge fixer upper. <laughs> and we're going hoping we can help with a few little jobs and hang out with them. But I don't know if you remember them. They spoke in your church, Luca, who I think was a toddler yeah. too. He was diagnosed with. Uh, uh, juvenile arthritis about a year ago and it's been really a you know a journey for them to get the right medication and everything but he's doing really well anyway we're excited to go and uh, you know it's a blessing for us to get to do this and you know, so we're, really happy. Yeah, we're looking forward to being with our kids and our grandkids <laughs> um, if you like your pastor if you love your pastor you can uh hold me accountable for getting him here uh now it wasn't that I uh, influenced him so much, but I was the youth pastor uh, at Anderson First when Sherilyn and Rick were part of our youth group. And I one day took them to Olivet on a trip to see Olivet. They were sitting in the back of the van and I saw them in the mirror and I said, probably put it in Sherilyn's because our home was kind of her second home. And uh, I put it in her head that, uh, hey, Rick, and Rick is a great guy. You guys should uh, kind of hook up, and they did <laughs> because they hooked up. So now you have your pastors. So, if you don't like him, you can blame me, but if you do like him, you can give me credit for it. So, <laughs> I know you love him, I know you love him, and we are so proud of you to hear what you're doing here and how God is moving. And uh, God is moving around the world, and we're happy to be able to share with you. Kay and I worked in the Middle East. Eastern Mediterranean for 37 years. Uh, we left Anderson um, back in 1979 and studied Arabic in Jordan. And then we went to, to live in Israel. And by the way, if you were in Israel today, they would be saying Shana Tova to you because that which means Happy New Year. T tomorrow begins, tonight is the uh, New Year's Eve. So this is the big party night for people in Israel. But um, anyway, we uh, lived and worked among mostly in of the Arabs. I became the, the field strategy coordinator for the Eastern Mediterranean. So I traveled outside of Israel, traveled to Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, um, Turkey, all the fun countries that uh, the State Department told me not to go to, but still I knew that God was there and wanted me to come and join him there. Amen. But uh, we had lived in Amman, Jordan, we lived in Nazareth, and we lived in uh, Bethlehem, and we lived in Jerusalem. We finished up. When we moved to Jerusalem, we actually moved into a Jewish community. Even though we spoke Arabic much, much, much better than we did Hebrew, we still moved into a Jewish community. And it was a, in the building we moved in, there were some Orthodox Jews, and we didn't really know much about them, and they certainly didn't know much about us. We had a man, uh, a man that moved in across the hall from us that probably had, it seemed like he had probably never met Christians before, especially born-again Christians. 
His name was Yaakov. And um, Yaakov was um, an unusual person. He was probably in his mid-50s. He was very ill. His health was bad. But he would come um, up the stairs, and especially if it was Kay by herself, he would not even acknowledge her because she was a woman. Uh, he would never, ever, he barely shook hands with me. You know, it was kind of the real weak handshake. But he hardly would speak uh, to us. He wouldn't have anything to do with us. and never came into our home. But uh, one Shabbat, or one Saturday, one Sabbath, he came and he knocked on our door. And he was leaning up against the doorpost. And I could tell he was very ill. He was perspiring. And I thought, Yaakov, you know, what, what's the problem? He said, you know, it's, it's Shabbat, Sabbath. I cannot call on the telephone. Can you call a taxi for me? I can't use the telephone. And he said, can you call a taxi for me? And he said, to take me to the emergency room. He said, I'm very sick. I said, let me take you there. I said, he said, no, 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 I don't want to bother you. I said, you know, Yaakov, you've been my neighbor for a while. I want to be your friend, and I want to be here to help you because I know you need some help. So I, uh, he let me take him. We kind of developed a, a little bit of a friendship there. We started at least communicating. And I left him there at the emergency room. They assured me that they would send him back. Well, when he came back, I heard him coming up the stairs, so I opened our door and I checked on him and said, Yaakov, how are you doing? Are you feeling better? And he was. He said they gave me some fluids and some medication. So um, anyway, every two or three hours, I would go and check on him. I said, do you need anything? He said, well, after Shabbat is over, after Sabbath is over, I'll call a taxi and I'll go get some uh, orange juice, which I really need to to drink, to rehydrate. And uh, I said, well, let me go now. Uh, I drive, I'm not Jewish, so I drive on Shabbat. So I drove to the, to the grocery store, bought him a bottle of um, orange juice. I brought it back and gave it to him. And every two or three hours I would go and knock on his door, yuck over, are you doing okay? Is it, are you feeling better? And he started, I could tell every time I saw him, he was feeling better. And uh, so that night, he came and he uh, he rang the doorbell and he said, uh, we're probably not on the door because our doorbell worked about half the time. <laughs> but anyway, he came and I, I, I could tell he was looking much better. I said, oh yeah, Kobe, you look so much better. And he said, um, well, I do. And I called, you know, he said, I immigrated from Panama. And he said, I call my family, my sister, my brothers, and my aunt and uncle in Panama. And they, I told them, I have this priest who lives across the hall from me. And this priest went to, uh, he took me to the emergency room. He said he wants to be my friend. And he went and bought me some orange juice and he's checked on me about every two or three hours. He knocked on my door to make sure that I'm okay. And he's offered to help me if I need help. And he said, um, they said, well, you know what you got to do? He said, they told me I should go out and buy you the best wine and vodka that I could find in this <laughs> I said, well, first of all, I don't, I stay away from drinking wine and vodka. So I said, let's just have tea or coffee together occasionally so that we can get to know each other better. And he asked me something that really kind of floored me. He said, uh, he asked me a question that I think is a question we all need to deal with every once in a while. He said to me, you don't drink wine and vodka? He said, well, what kind of a Christian are you anyway? Of a Christian, are you anyway? We ended up one of my uh, friends that came from Wales and lived in Jerusalem our last two years there. She looked at us and said, How interesting of God you spent so many years living in Arab areas and working with Arabs. In your last few years, you're in a building with Orthodox Jews, people who we really had no intention of getting to know because it was we were just worn out from trying to learn one culture, one society, and how good of God. And we ended our relationship with the Jewish people in there in a very positive way. Well, let's fast forward eight years. We moved from an urban area. Jerusalem is a city of about 600,000, something like that, where we could walk to the supermarket, we could walk to a coffee shop, where we could take public transportation and get where we wanted to. Even we loved living in the city and we ended up moving to suburban Indiana, living in Pendleton. I never had to worry about mowing a lawn. We had a small balcony that I could grow spider plants and geraniums on. That was enough for me. But all of a sudden, we had a backyard and we had to keep up with the neighbors and make it look nice. And 
you know what, we did it wrong. As soon as we got back, we annoyed our neighbor because we cut our grass too short on one of his part. And we just didn't know what to do. We'd never really dealt with garden care and things like that. But we thought, what we're gonna do, this is, we've been here about, I think, got back in July, it's Christmas time, we'll have a uh, coffee and tea on Christmas day, or the day, I think it was the Sunday before Christmas, and invite our neighbors. We hand-delivered messages to them and said, you know, about five or six, said, come over to our house in the afternoon, we're gonna have cakes and cookies and just say hi. Now, what we thought was it'd be like the Middle East. In the Middle East, people are so interested in your lives that they want to come over and see what your house looks like and what you eat, what you're doing, and we would have had a full house. They're nosy. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> but we prepared with the candles, put the carols on, and nobody came. Well, I'm, I'm pretty thick-skinned by now that I didn't take it personally. I just think they, they didn't know what to do with that. We don't do that in America. We invite neighbors. They have their friends. And what happened, though, is we mended some finches. No, mended some Spences, not some finches. <laughs> <laughs> Over the neighbors that we did it wrong. We annoyed the neighbor next just because we picked green beans that weren't really ours and ate them. That's not a good thing to do. <laughs> but by the next summer, we learned that summers are a great time to get to know your neighbors because people have to be outside and they are now. Do you know what we do? We pull our car in and we don't see people for about six months unless you're shoveling snow. But we've got to know our neighbors. And one of our neighbors is a, a guy who used to be a cousin contrary truck driver. And we were a little nervous, like, how's he going to feel about us? But we began to realize that God hid him there for a purpose in our lives to teach us about learning to love our neighbor who is different than us. Right. And we've become really good friends with him. And I, I, I walk almost every morning, and when he, he's not in good health. But when he's well enough, he's in his mid-80s, isn't he, Linda? He'll sit in his garage with the garage up in a chair and watch the world go by. And he'll stop me and yell at me. And I talked to him one day about his health and how he's doing. He said, it's not going very good. He said, I just, you know, I don't know if anything's going to work. And I said, you know, Linda and I are praying for you that you'll have something that gives you some relief from the pain he's having in his back and legs. And what he said to me really took me back. He said, thanks. I know you're religious people. I didn't know what to do with that. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to make him feel like, well, you. let me explain to you about how we Christians are. Here's, this guy is this and this. I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. But when I got back in, I said, look, he said something. And it, it, it bothered me because I want him to know that it's not a religion. It's my faith. And that I, it's not based on being even a good Christian or a good Nazarene. Or that we go to church all the time, because I know he sees us going to church. Or even that we good, do good things for other, um, others. I want him to know, he and his wife to know, that God has given us a faith that goes beyond a belief system. One that completes us and compels us with the hope we have as a Savior who loved us and redeemed us. And our story is there is hope. And I don't know how to interpret that to people whose life are in this man whose son is having a mental problem and possessed with a demon, I don't know how. But my job is to be a, a re ambassador for God and to be a portrayer, of, a passer honor of hope. So, so what is my identity as a Christian? What is my identity as a follower of Christ? Uh, what is your identity? How do people know you and why do they know or do they know that you're even a follower of Jesus? Certainly, my identity is not because I don't drink wine and vodka, but uh, my identity is found in, a fo I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Not only a follower of the stories that he told, the events that we saw him or we read about him doing, but it's actually being an agent and even being an ambassador, an ambassador for Christ. Now, we, as I said, we've traveled in a lot of different countries and we have um, we had to get visas, we had to do this and that. So often we would have to visit the ambassadors in the different countries, the U.S. ambassadors, and go to the embassies. And I learned what it was, and even deeper, what Jesus, or what uh, Paul says to the Corinthians about being ambassadors. Can I ask you to stand just for, a, uh, just for a minute as we read God's Word in respect of the Word? I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
And I'm going to start at um, chapter, or verse 14. And really the first sentence tells you, tells me why we were missionaries. Why we do what we do today. Why I'm here today. Paul said to the Corinthians, it's Christ's love that compels me. It's Christ's love that compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us, to us, the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Think about that. Fishers here. God is going to appeal to these neighbors, to these merchants in the stores, to the people that we see in our neighborhoods. God is making an appeal to, to win them to his heart through us. That's what he says in his word anyway. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to you. You may be seated. We are Christ followers who have a divine calling, not just literally, but you have a divine calling. Theologian N.T. Wright says that we have a vocation, a calling to share the divine ministry of the Messiah himself. We are to reflect God's image, and we do that by being ready to serve, to share, to give a testimony to the hope of abundant life in Christ. We must be willing to invest in people's lives to go where they are. I, I say this, and I, I'm sorry to say that it will probably be true, but fewer and fewer people are going to go to church, and we are the Messiah's representative in the world, where we run into people. And hopefully they will see the, the church as a place of community and, and where they can share together in their faith. But we've got to be ready to go there. We need to accept, accept them as Christ does. The Church of the Nazarene believes that we go across the street and around the world. And it's in our DNA that we are a missions church that does that. That We send, still send people like our kids to places that are not in the United States. Our, our, a lot of our missionaries now are not in North America, so from Africa and Europe and everywhere. Uh, and we have met some amazing people in our journey as missionaries and as we've traveled around. We have been uh, amazed at the sacrifice and the commitment of the young people that we have met for the Church of the Nazarene. One of them is a young man named Tim Evans. Now, Tim is Irish, but when he was a small boy, his dad uh, took a job in Bangladesh, and he lived there, I think, uh, eight or ten years. They moved back to Ireland, and he attended a local Nazarene church. Then he, began, he studied theology at our Bible college, is that right? And then he got a master's degree in de development, uh, you know, a relief work. Well, he was kind of, uh, he was a leader in the European church with the young people there, but he felt like he needed to come back and go overseas, and he ended up in Jerusalem. Well, when we met him, he was just kind of beginning to do his public ministry. He was going to preach for us because Lindo was traveling a lot, and we asked him to step in and help us out. I'll never forget the first time Tim stood up to speak. He was a nervous wreck, and he looked at everybody, and he stopped, and he said, I am so humble that God would ask me to speak here in front of you and to speak into your lives. And I've never forgot that. 
that he was humbled, and we are humbled, but he believed that every person was worthy of being listened to. He worked on building rela relationships in that community, and uh, he, he believed that that was important to show people that you care about them right. personally. Well, he taught us that, and we learned that we must keep an open heart. In this crazy, mixed up world that we live in now, if we don't have an open heart to others, how will they have an open heart to the Jesus that we love? Yeah. And uh, we have learned, Linda and I, since we've been back, that we have to respect and accept those who are not like us, religious, with, with their politics, with their morality, or any of that. We are to see them as God sees them. And if you ask God for opportunities, you better be careful because he's going to give you one. Because God is already at work in people's lives. And our prayer is that we will intersect in somebody's life at a strategic time and be his ambassador. And that's why we pray. That's why we pray for missionaries, that at some, some way God is going to intersect their lives with someone else. We, You know, we have this theological term, which is pra practically my favorite phrase in all of the theology I know is provenient grace. Yes. That the grace of Jesus is out there. And the song uh, we sing, Jesus, Jesus, how I, how I trust thee. The last line in that song is one that has really worked on my heart. Oh, for grace to trust him more. We sing, oh, I trust you, you've never failed me. But then the last line is we're right back to where we start. Oh, for grace, help me to trust you more. When we trust Jesus for those hard places we are, he will not fail us. He will use us despite us being in the way sometimes. He can still use us. I think when I trained to be a missionary, I thought I would probably be going to a place where God has not ever gone before. And he was going to send me, and of course he was going to go with me. But I discovered that there is no place in the world that God is not already through his spirit, and he's at work. He's at work. We would go into the darkest places that were darkened by Islam. And as I said, I went into to Syria and to Iraq and to Lebanon and to Jordan and all of those places that were filled with what I had always perceived as darkness. And yet I went and I found God there. And I think that immigrants and refugees that come in, hopefully they will be able to come in and they will know that God is waiting for them even here. And many of them have left, and they've already they've been in the presence of God there, but they're finding God here. And that's why we have such a responsibility to help those. <clears throat> I learned a lot, as Kay said, about provenient grace. And these are a few of the lessons that I learned. First of all, I learned that all people, no matter what their background is, all people are redeemable. Yes. All people are redeemable. Paul said in Romans, Romans chapter 10, he said that anyone or everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone who calls, no matter what their background is, as Kay said, no matter what their their their, uh, their theology is, no matter what their background is, no matter what the color of their skin is, no matter what the choices they make, no matter what those choices are, they are still, uh, they have that possibility of being redeemed. Yeah. And uh, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Also, um, I remember a few years ago we were at a restaurant eating with someone and yeah, there was a conflict going on between Israel and the Palestinians and uh, someone said to us, a man who was a follower of Christ said, I don't know why the Israelis don't go in and just wipe out all of them. And we, I thought, okay, we was gonna have to, I was going to have to hold her down a little bit. <laughs> thought she was going to smack the guy. No, she wouldn't if she's not violent. <laughs> but, um, no, but I thought, you know, but there are many, many people there that God doesn't want to see perish. Right. He says, my timing is not like your timing. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. And he is not willing that anyone should perish. So we see the people out here that we see maybe evil in their lives. We see this young boy that we prayed for this morning. But there is still, that is still a young man that God does not want to perish. And that's why we have to speak the name of Jesus Amen. over him and speak the name of Jesus over people. But God is not willing that any should perish. God wills to save those who are different than us, who are so different than us, make different choices than us. And he reconciles to, or he uh, wills to reconcile mankind, first of all to himself, as we read in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, to be reconciled to him 
and then also to be reconciled to each other. Amen. I think one of the most meaningful church services I have ever been, well, it was a class actually I was teaching. Um, I never considered it to be church because I didn't feel like I was so good as a teacher. But I was teaching a class about servanthood and being a servant. And it was in Northern Iraq. And uh, I was there and we had, oh, maybe 20 students there. And they were mostly men. There were a few women who came and stood in the back. And there were Kurdish Muslim background people who had accepted Christ. The women were still covered. The women still didn't ever shake my hand. They, they greeted me. They were always friendly to me. And of course, they served me a lot of food. That's why I'm pretty much like I am. But they, <laughs> they were very generous people. And, uh, but I remember we were going to close that service and all of a sudden the Iraqi pastor thought, you know what I think we need to do? You and I need to wash their feet. Um, and you know, they were, they're sandal wearers. They're like, in the, and, and there's dust, a lot of dust in that village that we were in. And just like in the time of Jesus, they, they wore, the servants washed their feet because they were, they were dust, walking on dust all the time. And we washed their feet. Well, we washed the men's feet. And all of a sudden, it was such a moving moment. I mean, Jesus was there. People were sobbing. And it was just, and uh, uh, Aziz and I were, were also sobbing. But it was such a beautiful moment. And all of a sudden, I saw one of the wives go up and whisper something to her husband. And I thought, oh, she must not be very happy about this or something's going on. Anyway, then he took her by the hand and brought her up and let us wash her feet. Here's a woman who'd never shaken hands with a man outside of her own family. And she wanted us to wash her feet. Well, what followed with that, these men went back and got their wives and said, come, we want the, the pastors to wash your feet. And so we washed your feet. It was such a meaningful, meaningful time. And it was definitely an experience where here are these people. There were Arabs. There were Kurds. There were, um, there were different backgrounds. And yet they were brothers and sisters in Christ. And they were being reconciled. There were men and women being reconciled because they had been brought together in Christ. God uses his word to prepare and to equip his people to do good works. So we are ambassadors. We are reconcilers, and this is our divine vocation that uh, N.T. Wright talks about. And we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And Linda and I have been traveling, you know, a lot the last eight years, speaking and sharing. And one thing we've said, the more like the world we become, the less we have to offer. They can get that anywhere, but what we have to offer is something so much more than that. When we worked on the, uh, in the Middle East, we were part of what was called the Eurasia region, which was uh, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Europe. And we got to meet some of the, like I said, some of the, CIS. oh yeah, it's Russia, CIS. right, CIS they call it. Have I covered them all? I think so. Anyway, yeah, okay. <laughs> so. But Europe is so postmodern now that it is extremely challenging. One of the pastors and his wife that live in Bulgaria have done an amazing job. I think they planted the church in Bucharest, didn't they? Yeah, and she was a nurse. And she was very aware of the human trafficking problem that existed in Europe. Her name is Monica Bosov. And she and her husband felt like something should be done. So they began to engage with the community, community of leaders who weren't interested in their church, but were interested in helping her to make a difference in the community. And they bought a property that was a house for women who were escaping human trafficking. So it was a safe place for them to escape to. And they did such a good job that Monica was honored by the United States uh, State Department for her work in that part of the world. Now, that place is a place of refugee. And I, we got an email or a little bit of a story of what Monica did when the, the war with uh, Russia hit the Ukraines and how they handled that. They had these properties. Well, we know that people were leaving, but there were also people who had been outside Ukraine, men who needed to get back to those countries. And five of them showed up in their city and they needed a place to stay. And they saw this place and they said, can we stay here? We'll pay you if you'll let us stay here. And they said, no, no, we don't want any money. Just stay here until you can get across back to the uh, Ukraine to, the, right. to help them out. So while they were there, they, the people were so impressed 
with the heart that Monica and her team had to minister to people. They said, we're going to tell other people that they should stop her. She said, go right ahead. This is what this place is for. They said, we've worked in these five months. We've worked in Turkey, Uzbekistan, and Denmark, but have never been treated like this with such love and care. Well, it was time for them to go. The opportunity came back, and they wanted to thank them. And she took a little Ziploc, uh, the, the man who was kind of the leader of these fights took a Ziploc bag, and in it he had something that was very precious to him. It was a piece of, uh, a chunk of bacon that was kind of symbolic of his country. And they said, this is very special to us, but we wanted to leave it with them. Monica says that it's the most precious gift that she's ever received. She put it in her freezer to remind her of all the blessings that have been given and the blessing they have to share, what God has given them to share. Yeah. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells a story of a, a, a man who had been beaten up and been uh, robbed and, and was really laying alongside the road to die. And uh, some religious men went by, two of them walked by, and they walked on the other side of the road so they wouldn't have to bother him. He told this story in response to someone said, um, you know, what do I have to do to receive eternal life? And Jesus said, love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And he says, I love your neighbor. And he said, well, who's my neighbor? So Jesus tells this story of these religious men who walked on the other side of the road because they did not want to touch this man who was different than them and who was wounded. And uh, so uh, the, the, a Samaritan man, now this was probably almost 100% uh, that this man was Jewish, the man that was in the ditch. And the Samaritans and the Jews were basically like enemies. It's like, kind of like the Palestinians and the Israelis today, but they were enemies. And yet the Samaritan was the one who saw a man who was broken, who saw a man who was hurt. And so he reached out and he took the man, he, fixed up his wounds, he took him and he paid for him to stay in an inn for the night and to get some rest, and he prayed for this man, or he, he paid for this man to really to be healed. And Jesus tells this story, and he says to us, he says, your neighbor is that one who is there. It may be one who is wounded, but maybe one who is just really in need of something. Right. Sometimes we just don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. We had a young man that was a neighbor of ours. His parents were near are really some of our closest friends. They were involved in reconciliation ministry. They had four boys, and their boys, one of the things they did, they swam. They swam, and they were some of the best swimmers in Israel. And uh, Daniel was the second one. And Daniel was a um, just a really a live wire. He was kind of the second child. And I don't know if you've had a lot of children. We've had we've had four, and our second one was always the one that entertain the family and kind of was the challenge <laughs> to be perfectly honest don't tell him he said that <laughs> don't tell him. And I don't, I don't, she's not listening but anyway she, daniel was kind of their challenge he was the fourth and but he was he was actually the second i mean he was the second one of the, of the four and he was a great swimmer well when he graduated from high school he came to the states and studied at the american university in uh in washington dc he went back knowing that he that God had something for him to do. He was raised in a very strong family. His father was Palestinian, Israeli, and his mother was British. And they were pretty strict with the boys, but they raised him in an Israeli school, so they grew up speaking, speaking Hebrew and Arabic and English and what other languages they learned in school. But uh, Daniel was a strong-willed man who was gonna do what he wanted to do, and he wanted to serve God. Well, he came back to to Israel and he said to his mom and dad I want to serve I don't know who to serve with and his dad said you know there's a, a Danish cup or a, was it Danish a Danish um, ministry that is in Greece right now and so many of the Palestine or the refugees were leaving from Syria and from Lebanon and from uh, northern Africa and he said there are a lot of them who are um, they're going in boats and you know it was when that picture of the little boy the little baby was laying on the beach there that had drowned and it was happening so often and then they daniel talked to them he said you know i'm a, a, a really good swimmer and he said i would love to be able to serve and they said daniel you're the man that god has brought to us and daniel would they would give him night glasses or night goggles a vision night vision uh, so that he could look out and he'd see those boats coming and if there were people who were having struggles getting out of the boats or people who were out there daniel would have these night glasses on 
and he would see the ones who were in need and he would swim out to them and rescue them. And I thought, God, why don't you just give all of us these night goggles, these special lenses so that we can see the people who need us, the people who need need help. I just want to give an update on Daniel. So that was eight years ago, right after we came back. And he stayed there and began to work in his dad's ministry of reconciliation between the Arabs and Jews. And about a year ago, his father resigned and he was voted to take his position as head of this reconciliation ministry. And we recently got a newsletter where he was in, invited to speak to Secretary of State Blinken about what was going on with refugees and that reconciliation. But I wouldn't have said a little as much when God is in it. You know, we kind of thought he was a rascal and like, I hope his parents get it to him. God gets hold of him before somebody else did, and he did. So, little as much. Yes, you yes. And there are things that we God has given to us. You think, oh, I don't have those kind of skills to uh, to do the kind of ministry that, that uh, Pastor Landon does or that someone else does. But God has given each one of us something to that he can use. In fact, I just want to end this by saying that Jesus said to, to his disciples, and, and he said to them, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because the night's coming, and no man can work. Right. And he also said to them that in this passage that we read, did you catch that very last part of that? He says, we are his ambassadors. And it's as if God is making his appeal through us. God is making his appeal through us. In order to do that and be what God calls us to be, and to do, uh, and we emphasize the do, the do part more than we do the be part, but he wants us to be as much as to do. We must be filled, first of all, with the spirit of Jesus. Right. We must be filled with his spirit. We must be filled with his character, his humility, his compassion, his gentleness with people's wounds, and his attention to the poor and the forgotten and the marginalized, his intolerance, we must be intolerant with religious hypocrisy. And there's a lot of talk going on that's being done in the name of Jesus that is just really hypocritical. We must not tolerate that. We must be clear to express the true love of God in Christ. We all have a calling. That's to be his ambassadors. We all have a vocation, and that is to serve him and to reflect Christ. May the God of, may the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Give us grace to trust him more so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I am nothing without Christ in me. Amen. Amen. May I tell about a miracle? Sure. Of, we've been through so many miracles that uh, I, I've got a list of, if you want to know the miracles we go through. Um, we were in a position where we needed a place to stay. We needed a place to stay because we couldn't get no other place to stay. We needed a place to stay. We needed a place to stay for three weeks. And we went to a place where this man came up to us. And he said, I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you. Here's a man I never knew, never met. But he said, I've been waiting for you. We needed that air residence for three weeks. He says, oh, I've got a residence for three weeks. He says, there's a gentleman that comes down here every year. This time of the year, he never misses. He's always here. And he said, this time, the gentleman did not reserve the place that was available. He said he didn't reserve it for three weeks. So had the, the guy came up to us, said, I have been expecting you, and I have a residence for you for three weeks. God goes on and on and on performing miracles. And when I pray for the young man, I know that God is working in that situation. And God does work today, and he does perform miracles today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda and Kay.
Um, can we thank Linda on getting to that? Uh, uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you both here with us and telling us about our calling to be God's ambassadors. It's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus because I just don't disagree with what he says. But it's another thing to actually live it in our in our neighborhoods with our neighbors and the people who we feel or perceive as far away from God. You know, we're we're all the same prayer away. You know, we're all the same calling out to God away. You know, so we need to be his his ambassadors. At this time, we're going to take a an offering. Um, you know, the offering today is going to go to our World Evangelism Fund. Uh, that's what Faith Promise is all about. Some churches, they have like long-term pledges. And if you want a long-term pledge, I'm not stopping you from doing that. Um, please do that and, and pledge in your heart and in your mind and pray to God that you, that you would commit to giving to missions every week or every month or every other month. Whatever God has called you to do, do that and, and be a cheerful giver is what the Bible says. At this time, we're going to take a, a special offering for that. And, um, and we're also going to hear a song as well. So, Dad, would you pray for us? Father, oh, we're so thankful for Linda McKay and all the work that you've done through this just because it meant obedience. Thank you, God, for your love for us. Take what we can get and multiply and multiply and multiply to the presence of your people. Amen. Take my cross to Calvary. 
free. Pay the price for all my guilty. Who would care that much about me? Thank you for this amazing time that we can learn about our calling. If we have Christ in our lives, we know we are called to represent you. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for this responsibility. And we ask that you help to equip us, bridge the gaps where we can't reach. In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. I just want to say that... Um, I love that song we just sang. I, I love that song. It has some creative grammar in it. And I just love the fact that I can make eye contact with Karen because she is a retired English teacher and we send telepathy to one another about, about how, I feel like there was justice served here today. Okay? About all of our English teacher experiences going in. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah. Well, thank you all so much for being here, participating with us, um, and uh, you are dismissed. Yeah. <laughs>